Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we need to start. Uh, I'm sorry for a little bit of a delay, one of our speakers doing traffic, but uh, let me start by inviting the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, uh, which uh, supervises ISIS, to provide some opening remarks and then we'll begin. And, uh, Dr. Ek, thanks for tonight. Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome and good morning to all of you. Uh, it is my pleasure to open today's ISIS uh, public forum on coping with the fourth industrial Re revolution. For this topic, our subtitle is Thailand's economic growth imperative, because we want to know more about the, fo the, the fourth industrial Re revolution and what it means uh, for Thailand. As you know, we have heard so much about Thailand 4.0 without knowing what Thailand 4.0 is or what it means. It reminds me of several years ago when we fed at the time of uh, the time was the AEC, which was only just one component of a broader ASEAN community. There were all kinds of seminars and workshops and talks and lectures about the AEC. The AEC has come and gone and now no one seems too interested in it. Do we have an AEC? How do we know what kind of AEC we have? Does it mean some kind of economic integration? Has the AEC fulfilled its objectives of reducing income disparity, realizing a regional production base, and integrating ASEAN into the world economy? These are questions not many people around here seem to want to focus on anymore. We don't want Thailand 4.0 to go down the same road of being something fashionable for a while and then it is not heard of much anymore. We do know that Thailand 4.0 is the Thai government's economic growth strategy. It is designed to usher the Thai economy into the 21st century global digital uh, digitization era by managing and capitalizing on the challenges and imperatives of the fourth industrial revolution. Yet, beyond public announcements and pronouncements, along with government-sponsored campaign, Thailand 4.0 is not sufficiently understood. Stuck in the so-called middle income trap, the Thai economy certainly needs to find ways forward in economic upgrading, education and bureaucratic reforms and restructuring. But how to proceed and how to sustain upgrading effort will be a paramount challenge beyond the incumbent government. Part of our intention this morning is to sustain our focus on Thailand in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. This is not some AEC fact, but Thailand's imperative. If the Thai economy cannot cope and capitalize on how the world will change, then Thailand will simply not do well in the world. This public forum brings a top line of uh, experts in macroeconomics uh, management, value chain upscaling and financial sector development to share their insights with us. Apart from being top expert in this subject, I would, I would like to add, to add that our panel today is well balanced uh, in gender terms. On a few occasions in the past, some participants noted that we have too many men uh, on our ISIS uh, panels. Uh, I don't think you will be saying that today. And uh, please let me thank all of the speakers 
for uh, spring that time and for sharing their expertise with us. Uh, first, Dr. Kilida Pau Pichit from the research, uh, research director for International Research and Advisor, uh, Advisory Service of the TDRI. Second, Associate Professor Pavida Pananond, uh, Associate Professor of the International Business, uh, Thammasat Business School, Thammasat University. Third, Dr. Suthapa Amon Vivat, uh, Chief Economist and First Executive Vice President of the Siam uh, Commercial Bank or SCB. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ajahn Titinan, uh, from uh, our uh, ISIS. So, please let me thank, uh, sorry, so let me thank uh, and thank the FNF and uh, the ACF Foundation uh, for their support. And now let me turn uh, the floor uh, back to uh, Ajahn Titinan. Thank you. I want to begin by prefacing this seminar in, in this way. Look, uh, as the Dean mentioned in the opening remarks, um, you know, the Thailand 4.0 is, uh, is a bit of a fad and, you know, it's, uh, it's mentioned a lot. And it's actually a government campaign, but it's not known. Uh, Dr. Grida, you're welcome right up here, just in time. Yes. This means that uh, you can still go first today as a speaker. Um, but uh, the 4.0, much talked about in the press and the news all the time, but uh, uh, we don't really know uh, what it's about. A lot of people don't know. So first I would say that the, the Thai economy is in trouble. The Thai economy is in trouble because Thailand no longer has a growth narrative behind it. Uh, I've had uh, some conversations with journalists, investors, and so on. And, uh, you know, if you look at Vietnam, you look at Indonesia, even Myanmar, uh, investors like a story behind economies. So for Thailand, it's had its heyday back in the 1980s, 1990s. In fact, Thailand has kind of wasted three decades, right? Uh, up to 19, you know, late 1980s, big boom, led to a bust in 1997. Uh, a big constitution, very reform-driven in 1997, eventually ended up with a coup in 2006. That coup in 2006 eventually brought on another coup, a related coup, in 2014. Along the way, the Thai growth narrative from being kind of a manufacturing base, the hub of Southeast Asia, and so on, uh, has dissipated, has lost momentum. And now we have uh, 4.0, which this, this 4.0 is fascinating. I, I want to begin, to, I just want to uh, relay a couple of anecdotes. If you go around the campus, we normally have a lot of uh, security guards. You know, they're underemployed, but it's a safe, stable employment. And traditionally, we have uh, a couple hundred security guards. And uh, it's a lifelong employment. But now security guards are out of work more and more uh, of the facilities are automated. So a lot of the parking, the garages, parking lots, uh, no longer need security guards. We, you know, you just need a little card and you just drive in. And it's becoming more and more like that. So when the security guards retire, they reach retirement age, they're not being replaced. Uh, so this is the, the age of new automation that we're seeing. Another one, to, uh, another anecdote would be, you know, if you go to some museums, uh, they have this kind of history of aviation. So I recently was at a, a museum, and uh, so aviation, we all, we've had aviation only in the last century or so. So, you know, it always goes back to the Wright brothers that's trying to fly a plane with little wings and so on. Eventually we have what we have today. So now we are supposed to be, and I think we are, at a stage of uh, the 1910s and 1920s in aviation. But the new aviation development will be robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, a lot of these disruptive technologies that will replace uh, labor and perhaps put an end to uh, manufacturing. Uh, this 3D printing, I'm not an expert, uh, but 
the more I read, I think the, the more that the manufacturing will not be the same. Uh, there will not be you know, mass assembly anymore. And then if you watch uh, these Tesla cars, you know, these so-called autonomous, not automated, but autonomous cars, and you can see them, uh, if you go see Fast and Furious 8, uh, there, there's a scene that all of a sudden these cars, they just got hacked, and they can be controlled from somewhere else, and they jam the streets. So uh, this is a new era. For Thailand, uh, the manufacturing is finished. I mean, Thailand, will, manufacturing is no hope for, for Thailand because of Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, elsewhere. Uh, so it has to be, I think the services will be the new manufacturing. And Thailand is, is well behind, you know, look at education system, infrastructure, all kinds of uh, challenges uh, and shortcomings. Uh, people talk about nanotechnology, biotechnology, but in fact, uh, a lot of it is uh, superficial. So today, to complement perhaps uh, this government's uh, 4.0 campaign and beyond this government is for the future of the Thai economy, which is to say the future of Thailand. And if the Thai economy doesn't keep expanding, Thai politics will be in even more trouble, even more trouble. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored uh, here uh, today. We have uh, speakers, you know, always uh, the big challenge for organizing seminars is first to come up with a good idea uh, and then to get uh, the good speakers. Uh, and if you have that and you have the support of uh, uh, good institutions, uh, uh, well-intentioned, uh, like the FNS, Asia Foundation, then uh, you can organize forums like this. So uh, first, I'll come down. I think we will shuffle the speakers lineup. Uh, Dr. Kirida, if you don't mind speaking first. Uh, speakers have a few slides, not too many, and then uh, Dr. Pavida will, will uh, go after after that, and then uh, Dr. Sutapa. And as you can see, the, the men are outnumbered on this panel, uh, which we like to, to see anyway. And then Kun Prin Panichapak uh, from Credit Lyonne. I think that the dean might have uh, omitted your name, but uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, so first, let me just pass the microphone to Dr. Grida. Uh, 20 minutes, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Tidinan. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Titinan has mentioned, Thailand 4.0 is something that is, you know, top of the town at the moment. But uh, we want to know, in reality, you know, how real is it? Uh, is it a myth or is it uh, a reality? So, I, you know, will give one view about this, and I'm sure other speakers here will have their views on the other sectors of the economy as well. I remember the last time I was here, the Tinan, I was still with the World Bank. Um, but since then, I have now moved to TDRI um, for less than two years. So most of the information you are seeing here are either from TDRI or from the World Bank. So please don't be surprised. Well, let me first give you sort of like a status check for Thailand. And after seeing the status check, you will realize why do we need to move to Thailand 4.0. Right? I'll go through this quickly because most of you know about this. You know that Thailand has been stuck in the middle income trap for the past 30 years, right? Um, this is the categorization of uh, countries' incomes by the World Bank. And since the World Bank had started categorize, um, you know, categorizing this since 1985, Thailand has always been middle income. Yes, we have moved from a lower middle income to a higher middle income, but it's still far away from getting to a high income status, which requires that, you know, income per capita is around 13,000 US dollars, which Thailand at the moment is now at around 5,500. So you know, we need to double, more than double, in order to get to a high income country status. So that's one challenge that we have. And the other challenge that Thailand has is that although Thailand has been growing in the past, um, of course slower in the recent past, we still find that inequality is very high in Thailand, right? Because um, Comparing, uh, this is income inequality, comparing Thailand to other countries in the region, yes, we see that you know, inequality has fallen a little bit, income inequality has fallen a little bit, but compared to other countries in um, East Asia, Thailand's income inequality is still the highest, even higher than China. Of course, China is catching up, but we're still higher than China. So there's an issue of you know, trying to grow faster, but at the same time, we want to grow inclusively and not leave anybody behind, right? So that we can close this income gap. But the income gap, in my mind, is only um, an outcome of other factors, right? There, there must be inequality elsewhere, which 
then leads to an inequality in incomes of people. And one of that, I think, which is very important, is education. There is so much disparity in the quality of education in the different regions of Thailand, right? I'm, I'm you know, um, drawing this information from the uh, Human, Develop Human Achievement Index that the UNDP produces um, annually. And it shows that access to education, for example, is much better in Bangkok than in other parts of the country. And here, the Human Achievement Index puts together seven or eight indicators for education. Access to education is one. Um, you know, the quality of education test scores is the other. So you can see that the Northeast um, and the South would have the lowest quality of education. And this is, in my mind, where the, then the difference in incomes then come from. So education is definitely one type of inequality that Thailand would need to address. But other than you know, having you know, to grow faster, wanting to grow inclusively, we, don't have, we, not, we must not forget that Thailand is also aging very quickly. Right? So here's another setback where we're going to be old before we get rich. Right? And like Singapore or Japan, where they got rich before they got old. But unfortunately in Thailand, we, we have aged very quickly. And actually by you know, the year um, 2025, which is just a few years from now, we will be a completely aged society. And aged here, I don't mean like wine. It's, it's more like we're going to have a quarter of our population um, having uh, an age more than 60 years old, right? And, and that's worrisome because it you know, implies that our labor force in the future will be falling. And this is a, um, a calculation done by the World Bank uh, using um, the UN population data. And it shows that you know, in, in from 2010 to 2040, Thailand's labor force will have fallen by 10%, right? While as um, other countries in the region, whether it be Malaysia, Myanmar, Indonesia, Cambodia, Philippines, Laos, Timor, their labor force, their yeah, young people are still rising. So, you know, this is a, you know, this is a, you know, a, a, a big challenge for Thailand, where we want to grow faster, we want to grow inclusively, but we'll have lots of old people as a share of our population. So if we were to actually grow faster and grow you know, more inclusively, we would need each person, right, each labor force to be more productive, since there will be you know, fewer you know, labor force. So let's look at the labor force or the labor productivity in Thailand. And here, as Dr. Titinan has said, right, there are you know, those who are unemployed, underemployed, right, right? So for example, if we look at the services sector in Thailand, right, this is labor productivity. And we see that it's, it's quite low compared to Singapore and Malaysia. Well, manufacturing is, is, is low, but services is even lower. And, and here are your uh, security guards right, in the services sector right here. So this is why you know, we really need to also upgrade our human capital to 4.0, because we can't have you know, fewer labor force and each having low productivity as it is you know, going forward. But other than, you know, other than that, um, in the economy, there are things outside the economy that is changing very rapidly as well, right? So that will also affect how Thailand grows. And one of them is the disruptive technologies that Dr. Titinan talked about, right? There are actually 12 of them. Um, disruptive technologies, by the way, was first coined, the term was first coined by McKinsey when they came out with their report on disruptive technologies in 2014. And these are the 12 disruptive technologies, right, ranging um, all the way from mobile internet, you know, to um, 3D printing, to technology for batteries, renewable energy. So all these will come to Thailand. We can't avoid it, right? And we're already already seeing the Alibaba coming into Thailand, right? For e-commerce, we're already seeing, you know, fintech um, uh, companies, you know, starting up in Thailand. So this will again, you know, these are moves in the services sector, which will affect the manufacturing sector as well. So we'll have to also be coping with these um, as well. And don't forget, the world is different now. Right? We're not in a fast growing you know, global economy where world trade you know, grows double when, you know, when world growth, world GDP growth or world economic growth grows by 1%. In the past, 
world trade grows by, grew by 2%. But in the world today, where there's more protectionism, where there is more consolidation of supply chain, we actually find that after the global financial crisis, when world GDP growth is 1%, world trade growth is also only 1%. So the relationship has weakened. So we can't expect you know, a very vibrant world trade growth, even that now we're seeing that the global economy is recovering. So Thai exports, Thai export special manufacturing, right? is not going to grow by over 10%, you know, as we did. Um, if we can grow by four or five percent, we're very happy right, these days. So again, we're faced with this, um, you know, a challenge that what to do with our manufacturing exports. So we need to actually be more innovative, maybe move to some niche markets or niche products in order to sustain you know, our exports going forward. But when we look at the ranking of Thailand's competitiveness, and, and, and many of you have read you know, in, in the papers of read the World Economic Forum report, we find that Thailand is still you know, pretty weak. And this is only comparing to the average of East Asia. It's not even comparing to the you know, developed countries. This is the, comparing to East Asia and Pacific. We're pretty weak on whatever issues of you know, human capital, right? whether it be you know, health and education, or whether it be innovation or higher education. We are you know, below the, the region average on those, right? So it's really an impetus that we, we, need to, you know, we need to step up on this. And when you actually look at the structure of Thailand's economy, you know, it, it's, you know, it's really urgent because as you can see here today, there are around 33% of the labor force in the agriculture sector. Right? While as the agricultural sector produces only 7% of GDP. So 33% of people producing only 7% of output, right? That's, that's not a good sign, right? While as in the services sector, right, we have around 43% of the labor force there, and they produce around a little more than half. So you know, maybe around one to one, right? Not that productive, unlike the manufacturing sector, where it only hires 16.8% of the labor force, but it produces almost 30% right, of output. So we can see that the sectors that are still behind are the services sector and the agricultural sector, that we really need to either boost its productivity or move people out of that sector to more productive sectors like manufacturing or service. But that will take, again, you know, the improvement of human capital so that they can move out of the agricultural sector. Right? So here again, as Zatiyanan says, services would probably be the next you know, driver of Thailand. But of course, we would need to really address um, issues that are still impeding the services sector in Thailand. And, and I'll um, highlight some of them you know, in the in, um, next few minutes. So given all this big picture of where you know, Thailand is coming and what outside forces are actually impacting Thailand, you know, Thailand hasn't come up with a vision. I call it a vision, right? It's not a plan, it's not a strategy, it's a vision, where it's called Thailand 4.0, where we want to try to move the country from being manufacturing to a more services-driven, more digital you know, um, economy. And the slogan for this um, vision I'm not saying this by myself. This is taken from Dr. Suwit Mason, see the Deputy Prime Minister. He says, the Prime Minister says, we'll be stronger together and leave no one behind, right? So there's a lot of, of, of important words here. So stronger together, leave no one behind. So it's you know, cohesiveness, but you want to be stronger, you want to grow. So hence, you know, given this big you know, sort of um, mission <laughs> that Thailand wants to achieve, the Thailand 4.0 model came, came about, right? That we want to upgrade. Basically, if you actually look at Dr. Sewitz Mason C's um, PowerPoint, and actually Thailand 4.0 is his brainchild. His PowerPoint, about 200 pages, 200 slides, <laughs> has um, everything, right? It's a vision for Thailand to meet that, you know, that, that goal. And it has, Thailand has to become, you know, Thailand uh, society 4.0, Thai people 4.0, agricultural industry, SME services, government, 
provincial clusters have to all be upgraded. It's a big task. It's a big task, I must say. But I would say it's a vision. And Thailand never had this kind of vision before. And like Malaysia or Korea that had a vision you know, for its future, Thailand never had one. So this is sort of like a goal that we strive to meet. But then in reality, we'll come and assess in a little bit whether you know, at least in the next four to five years can we reach that. So as I mentioned to you, in Thailand 4.0, the structure of the economy would need to be changed, right? We, we would want to move um, to a more higher value added, whether it be agriculture, whether it be service, whether it be industry, right? And there are different sectors that um, you know, they've looked at and said, you know, this is where we can go. For example, in um, agriculture, we can do more bioenergy, more you know, agro-tourism, um, using herbs to produce medicine cosmetics, right? In services, being a medical hub, being a trading hub, logistics hub, um, aviation hub, for example. And in advanced technology, as Alatia Tinan mentioned, um, next generation automotive, maybe self-driving cars, robotics, um, and you know, smart electronics. So that actually, then if you look at it carefully, it actually translates to what's actually now in the Eastern Economic Corridor. You know, when I look at Thailand 4.0 across the country, I don't actually see it happening much except in the Eastern Economic Corridor, which um, you know, has sort of uh, taken you know, its own life. It has its own committee now. Um, it's going to be like the East Sink Seaboard you know, that had you know, pushed Thailand's growth up in the, um, in the 80s. So this is an expansion, basically, of the eastern seaboard. And inside this economic corridor, of course, the government will put in a lot of infrastructure. Um, and they would like to promote these new industries that I talked about. They call it the S-curve and the new S-curve industries. Right? So in the projects that are in the EEC, um, as I mentioned to you, the government will put in some infrastructure, you know, whether it be ports, rail, road, um, the, you know, Utapau Airport, right, upgrade Utapau Airport, and then they would try to attract new um, S-curve and new S-curve businesses to come and invest in this area. Um, of course, again here, the targeted businesses are similar to what I mentioned to you under the 4.0 just now, right, whether it be, you know, agriculture, services, or, or industry. So we did, in t at TDRI, um, we did a little analysis on whether these you know, S-curve and new S-curve businesses will actually take off in Thailand at least in the next four to five years, right? And we'll go through each. So there's some S-curves um, and there are new S-curves. So if I can take you through it quickly, our conclusion is that the existing S-curves that you know, that the government would like to promote now, whether it be next um, generation autom uh, automotive, smart electronics, um, wellness, um, tourism, or biotechnology, agriculture, or food, that's something that Thailand already has some competitive advantage. And building up on them would not be too difficult. So, so our assessment, as you can see, most of the circles here, <laughs> our assessment, um, are you know are, are full except for the next generation automotive because we think that um, it will not be easy um, to move for example from you know the current type of cars to um, electric cars because it will totally you know affect the supply chain in Thailand and it, it will require a different supply chain basically which Thailand doesn't have at the moment so that will be a challenge but for the others it seems like you know we have we have some uh, some comparative or competitive advantage there. But as for the new S-curves, biotics, you know, uh, biofuels, biochemicals, um, integrated healthcare, digital business, aviation and logistics, we think that it will happen, but at a much lesser scale. For example, aviation, yes, we probably would be a repair hub, right? But that's probably you know, the, you know, the extent we can do cargo, we can do repairs, but that will be the extent that that will happen at that hub. Um, same with digital businesses. I mean, we can you know, put in internet ar ar across the country, but um, 
it will be to the extent that you know, ser it will serve the uh, domestic market more than the, the foreign uh, or the, or the um, markets outside of Thailand. And one of the reasons why we say so, and if you look at the columns as reasons, and I look through them as well, it's, it's people. You know, where do you find good engineers, good scientists, you know, to uh, enough of them, you know, at an affordable price, of course, to work in these, um, in these industries, right, and, and make them thrive. So that's the big issue, why we, you know, we still have question marks on whether these new S-curves can take place, because they will require a whole new set of, uh, you know, of, of people and skills. So my conclusion slide is that if we were to actually move Thailand 4.0 forward, I would think the most important thing would be people. We would need to move our labor force up to 4.0 as well. There was a joke that you know we want to go to Thailand 4.0, but our labor force is still 0.4. So what do we do with that? You know, because when we look at the PISA scores, when we look at the test scores of you know students in primary and secondary school, which is basic education, right? We we don't you know we don't we're not very hopeful for you know, innovation, higher education. So, so that's something that, that I think will be very important and it has to be done you know, in a, what the World Bank calls a life cycle um, education development, or in Thai we call it from womb to crema um, crematorium, right? <laughs> so it's a lifelong learning because skills need to be upgraded constantly these days because business has changed so quickly. Um, and of course, as time is aging, we're not, you know, we're not having a labor force, you know, um, growing anymore. I think one of the other things that would probably help is opening up our labor market to professionals from outside of Thailand, which is something Thailand hasn't really done. We, ha we have opened up to unskilled labor, but we are very restrictive, as in most ASEAN countries, very protective of our um, professions, doctors, nurses, you know, engineers, architects, accountants. You know, these are professions that are protected and foreigners without a license from Thailand cannot work here and most of the exams to get licenses are in Thai. So it's, you know, it's, it's um, as you can imagine, and Thai language is not very easy <laughs> to, to master. So I think that would be, you know, one quick win that Thailand could do um, as, you know, as we, you know, try to address the shortages in, in skills at the moment. The other issue that I think is as important as, as people, and it would actually help facilitate the movement of Thailand up the value chain, is the government you know, procedures and regulations. Right? I mean, if, if, you know, if you've worked you know, in the business sector here in Thailand, you know there's so many cumbersome regulations at the moment. Um, and procedures you know, take very long, as you know, in the World Bank's ease of doing business ranking. Thailand has been ranked you know, in number 45, I think, out of 188 countries for, for several years. Um, you know, we have not been able to improve the ease of doing business, meaning the interactions you know, that businesses have with the government agencies. Right? There's red tape, basically. <laughs> There's still red, red tape. And we, we want to improve that right? to make businesses, to make these S-curves or new S-curves you know, take off um, uh, more easily. And there are many outdated regulations in Thailand, right? Dating from, you know, 80 years ago, and we're still using that. We have in total, um, TDRI did a study. We actually went and added up all acts, all regulations, and ministerial orders. And I think it came up to like over 100 of them. So if you're a business and you're trying to, let's say, set up a factory, you have to go through, you know, all this list and see which ones are, you know, are relevant to you. And, and it's very cumbersome. So we had a, a, a project that's called the Regulatory Guillotine, where we tried to chop down um, outdated and necessary um, you know, business regulations, as, as Korea has done. And they've chopped their, their regulations and acts down to you know, more than half. You know, less, so now there's fewer, less than half of the regulations um, before they were chopped down. So that's something that I think needs to be done as well in Thailand. And we have a project ongoing with the business sector about, about this, which we would like to pre um, present to the government and hopefully they'll do something about it. But um, again, uh, it, it's up to the political will there. And lastly, um, 
on the government itself, right? Policies, you know, need to be consistent. You know, if you want to move people, you know, out of the agricultural sector to more productive, you should, you know, support their education of the children. At the same time, you should not be support aggressively supporting agricultural prices. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll be kept in the sector rather than wanting to move out, right? So, these, this is an example of consistency of of, of um, government policy and, of course, continuity, right? What what if this government goes? You know, will the next government continue, you know, this Thailand 4.0? Will they continue the 20 year, you know, um, Thailand strategy? That I think is, is quite important, especially in reforms such as education that takes time. We, we need consistency in, in the policy. So I think I'll end with that for this round. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it, uh, you used a little bit you used a little bit more than the allotted time, but but worth every second of it. Worth every second of it. It's a, it's a uh, in-depth, uh, incisive overview of the state of the Thai economy, the challenges uh, uh, out there, uh, multifaceted. Uh, Dr. Kirida mentioned uh, Dr. Suwit Mason C. Uh, he used to be a professor on campus here. Now he's a, he works for the government. Uh, the problem that we have is that the people who are doing 4.0, they don't have the absolute power. And the people who have the absolute power in Thailand, they don't know really know about the 4.0. Um, that's one problem. And then uh, she mentioned about the, Dr. Greta touched on this uh, people 4.0. I think that's something uh, very important. If you look at the AEC that the Dean mentioned, you know, it doesn't work well. Because if you want to attract professionals, you come to Thailand, uh, say you're a doctor from Philippines, you have to pass, uh, you get a medical license. The test is in Thai. So if you don't know Thai, you cannot do it. A lot of jobs, you need uh, Thai registration cards, registration numbers. So one way to really uh, get over this barrier, the, the human resource, the manpower, is to attract more talent. Um, and we can do this by regulatory overhaul, make it easier for, for professionals to work here, like the Singaporeans do very well in this. And also on the, on the bottom side, um, you know, the unskilled labor, we can really alleviate this demographic stress and strain by allowing the migrant workers to have more rights, you know, more residency in Thailand, uh, so it's a bit of a depressing kind of uh, challenges, and but in fact, is there's some hope. It's very doable. The answers are out there. Uh, Dr. Kirida mentioned value chains. Let me move now to uh, Dr. Pavida, uh, who will tell us a little bit about the challenges ahead for for Thai capital, Thai multinationals, and uh, the dynamics in the uh, value chain uh, upscaling. Uh, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning, and thank you, uh, Institute of Security and International Studies, Thailand. I don't want to mention ISIS because uh, uh, the name could mean something else. So thank you, uh, ISIS Thailand, for having me on the panel today. I have a very difficult task of uh, being placed along with uh, speakers who are very uh, professional and uh, well supported by their institution. When I prepare a talk, and I know that I would be with uh, Kun Prin, Dr. Uh, Girida, and Dr. Sutapa, I know that I should not go with information because they would do all the information providing. So I'm glad that Dr. Girida came in time to start uh, this morning and now. But I am still face the difficulty because I'm tasked to talk about two very trendy things that most people talk about, but perhaps don't always know what they talk about. And these two things are the fourth industrialization or the 4.0, and then another thing is global value chain. We hear a lot about the global value chain, but we don't really hear it in detail what they talk about when they talk about global value chain. So today is a task that is, uh, I try to meet by linking these two things together. But I would like to stress that I think that the need to consider upgrading uh, of the Thailand infrastructure and industrial and economic development model is something that we need no matter we have 4.0 or not. And whether it's 1.0 or 2.0, we should actually be looking at the growth imperative that Thailand has been following over the past uh, few decades and the next decade that we are going into. So my talk today would concentrate on those things. And I know that Dr. Titinan is not very fond of PowerPoint, so I uh, try to restrict uh, my PowerPoint to the minimum and I start with my main point up front. 
So I think that uh, the first point that I would like to convey today is that the fourth industrialization or 4.0 trend, uh, the bottom line of it means that it is something that requires efficiency and innovation. I think that is clear, but I think that without stressing the need to understand this so much, we would be lost in talking about the 4.0 as a new infrastructure and the digital technology that we need to talk about. But in fact, it is about how to use the improvement of technology to address the productivity and efficiency that Dr. Girida has already mentioned. That's my first point, and I would elaborate this point further on along my presentation. The second point that I would like to stress today is that Thailand's traditional growth imperative are based on capturing low value added activities uh, along the global value chain. And I think this needs to be changed, 4.0 or not. This is the way that we need to move further in uh, order to upgrade our economy. And I uh, forget to mention that uh, most of my talk uh, have been based on my research that have been uh, supported uh, with, uh, thankfully, two, uh, two organizations. Uh, one uh, is also represented here, the Asia Foundation, and also the Thailand Research Fund that uh, support uh, these related uh, topics of research. Uh, the third point that I would like to mention is that 4.0 and new growth imperative. And I think that when we look at the issue of uh, global value chain, uh, what we need to address is that we would need to look more seriously at how Thailand should be positioning itself and upgrading its industries, its uh, business, and uh, its overall competitive positioning in the global value chain and how do we move that to the higher value added activities. Not just attracting newer and sexier industries like robotic or uh, medical equipment, but we need to look at the existing set of industries and look at how to increase the efficiency and productivity of those. So I might differ a little bit more from the government policy, which I think I tend to uh, in general, but that's uh, what academics should do, I think. I don't think that we need to be only looking at the new industry, the S-curve and all that. So in, in fact, I'm glad to hear what Dr. Girida just mentioned, that we actually have uh, a lot of rooms to grow in the existing industries that she has already mentioned. And uh, the second point under that category is that internationalization of Thailand needs to move beyond export. We have been talking about uh, export decline and uh, moving export and finding new markets. Why that needs to be done? I also think that uh, we need to be looking at other type of internationalization. And this did refer directly to outward foreign direct investment by Thai firms and looking at opportunities overseas. Uh, the third point, which I probably don't have time to address today, is the institutional readiness, which I'm sure that Dr. Kirida has already touched on a lot of that, especially on the uh, bureaucratic and the government capacity and uh, competencies in handling this thing. So I think that is already something that we uh, can hear more uh, from other panelists. What I'd like to move on now is just to move on uh, what we talk about when we talk about 4.0. I think that uh, when we hear all these things that come at the same time, fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, and Thailand 4.0, which is probably the latest, but we hear the most. And I think that this year you would hear that the seminar move, the seminar scene would move rapidly from last year AEC to this year 4.0. Everyone is putting 4.0 behind. And I was, I was trying to see if the education 4.0 would work by seeing if remote control would work from my end so that we don't have to shuffle seating or anything. So uh, it works. But uh, when they talk about the fourth industrial revolution, 
uh, do they really know that what they mean by the first, second, and third uh, industrial revolution? I think that we have seen this taking place in our uh, over the long historical period, perhaps not in our lifetime. But uh, mechanical production, water and steam, is the first industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution refers particularly to mass production. The third one to automation. And I think the fourth industrial revolution still refers specifically to uh, digitization. But are we running out of this? Uh, do we don't see any trace of the first industrial revolution? I would say not. Because I think that traces of all these things still happens in the world and in different parts of the world. So we have not really totally moved beyond, but uh, the industrial de revolution or new technological development comes to improve on the previous one. But mind you, I just uh, got stuck in the traffic caused by uh, the Thai Belgium bridge, and I still see machinery that looks very 1.0 to me, uh, and not very 4.0 when, when I see uh, that they still use the machine that used to represent the steam uh, engine sort of type of machine looking on the Thai Belgium bridge. So maybe. Belgium have to do something. Uh, I'm not sure if the ambassador is here. But uh, so, and then we move to Industry 4.0, which I think Germany deserves some kind of uh, credit because I think Thailand basically get the 4.0 from Germany and then we just jump on the bandwagon and that's why I call it 4.0 bandwagon. And the uh, Industry 4.0, I would not dare to uh, read the reference, uh, but it basically point out to the need that the physical world and the virtual world merge into cyber physical uh, system. Uh, so what are all these uh, commonality between the discussion that is going on in the world? I think two key words are the productivity and the efficiency that the new age of technology can be used to improve the existing system. But I think that the Thai government has not stressed enough of that point because we are stressing more on the new sectors, the new technology, and the new things that we want to do. The kind of digitalizing uh, all the uh, villages by having Wi-Fi network covering the countries, the need to uh, make government 4.0 by Prayut having Twitter account and Facebook so that he can correspond directly with Trump. Things like that are just the very uh, basic 4.0 item. I think what really needs to be conveyed more is the implication that uh, value is being uh, increasingly created and captured in the more knowledge intensive kind of activities. And I think that should be key point, or at least it's my key point in uh, answering the 4.0. And here I move on to introduce the second topic that is very sexy in the world uh, global economic development at the moment. And we also use that uh, these days a lot, uh, is the global value chain. And when pe people talk about global value chain, we kind of have vague understanding that it means how countries and firms are integrated together in, uh, in the industries. I think the most used examples is how iPhone it can be produced in different parts of Asia, and then it is uh, sold mostly in Europe or in America with the value that is much more than the sum of its parts. And iPhone is also used to, to point out that when you look at uh, any value chain, you would see that the different activities that used to be concentrated within one location has been now disaggregated across the world, across countries. And then different countries and different firms in different countries capture different part of this uh, value chain. And what has taken place uh, over the past two decades is that firms that are advanced firms that have knowledge in R&D or in marketing normally control that part of the value chain, but outsource the most standardized part of the production. And that happens to be the manufacturing part. And those parts are outsourced to emerging markets, particularly those in uh, Asia, because of their lower cost of production. Uh, majority the uh, factor of production, the labor costs are lower. So this has been more or less the growth imperative for many countries in export-oriented 
in Southeast Asia in particular. And you can see that our uh, automotive sectors and our electronic sectors, as well as agribusiness, follow this model. So we welcome inward foreign direct investment who set up manufacturing plants in Thailand or now in Vietnam and increasingly in uh, Cambodia as well. And at the same time, uh, those firms maintain the sales and marketing and distribution network in their own countries. They buy from us and then they do their own direct uh, uh, sales and distribution. And they also invest in their own R&D. What most emerging markets do is just to receive order and then uh, follow what has been ordered and then uh, try to meet that order over time. So that's okay as long as you know, uh, the world continues to consume as much as it used to. But with the increasing integration of value chain, you can see that this model has entered into saturation. Uh, the demand growth is not so much anymore in the large emerged market like the, U the EU or the US. The new emerging markets have now shifted to this area. So it's uh, within Asia as well that the new demand markets are happening. So that also put pressure on the value chain because if you only focus on supplying and then exporting the lowest part of the value chain, you end up having your demand reduced because of the overall uh, re reduction of demand. So what should countries that used to follow that kind of export-oriented and manufacturing base do? You can look at uh, different kind of upgrading. You can look at process upgrading or product upgrading. That means you produce better product. Yes, we have uh, rice, so now we can produce more organic rice and we can package it better. That's kind of product upgrading. You can also put emphasis on how to produce rice more efficiently. Uh, our rice productivity is even less compared to Vietnam. How could that be? How could rice integrate the kind of sophisticated technology such as the satellite technology and make sure that our farming can be based on satellite mapping? Things like those need to be addressed in the uh, process of uh, 1.0 manufacturing industry. I beg to differ. I think manufacturing would stay on, Dr. Titinan, but in a new kind of era. So that kind of upgrading has been something that emerging economies normally done. Because the buyer, the lead firms in emerged market also want better product and also want product with better technology. So these two types of upgrading has been well supported by uh, multinational enterprise from the, from the Western countries. Uh, companies like Pandora, which now invest heavily in Thailand because they find that Thailand is a good manufacturing base and they invest in uh, upgrading the process and all that. But then, if countries don't move beyond that, they somehow hit the glass ceiling because the value of the product is not really in the manufacturing anymore. Look at iPhone, for example. There has been academic research that uh, add up all the parts of iPhone, and it adds up to less than 20 US dollar, whereas it's sold for 200 US dollar. So who capture the main value of that product? It's Apple. So uh, most of the value is captured in the upstream or the downstream end of the value chain. So what should firm do? They definitely should uh, try to move, I call this horizontal upgrading, by trying to engage more in the value-added activities. And some Thai firms have been able to, de to do that. For example, CP is ex uh, investing a lot in R&D in biotechnology, or Thai Union Frozen is buying brands in Europe so that they can control their own marketing and distribution. So that's one model that 4.0 or not, I think that Thailand should be looking at how should we improve our industries along the value chain better. Second model of upgrading, I call it vertical upgrading. When you have the value chain and then you have uh, companies and countries occupying the main position in the manufacturing sector, you can actually move that up by becoming real expert in the manufacturing. And I call this by you know, increasing scale and then doing the manufacturing that you become so good at manufacturing and supplying this that everyone would have to rely on you. 
Foxconn is a good example for uh, iPhone because they manufacture some part that even Apple is not manufacturing that and is not putting R&D in that. So that kind of being the supplier that are key and critical supplier to major export of the world is another thing that we should be looking at. And automotive is a good example of how do we increase the supply chain of automotive that is already there so that we become such critical supplier to, uh, to automotive companies in the world. That's another challenge that we are looking at. And that's where outward foreign direct investment come in. This graph shows you the trend of inward foreign direct investment flows into Thailand and the trend of outward foreign direct investment flow. You can see that after the year 2000 onward, the trend of inward foreign direct investment has been fluctuating very uh, heavily. And actually, at some point in time, Thai outward foreign direct investment has surpassed the amount of the inward foreign direct investment inflow. This means that now expanding beyond Thailand is another imperative that is critical to Thailand economic growth. And these are details of uh, what firms are doing. I took this, uh, this is my study that is uh, based on the activities of set listed firms that have announced their international activities. And I look at what they do when they uh, go abroad. I'm sorry that the number might be small, but the yellow color is the one that is the uh, sales and uh, operation. So meaning that they are doing the same thing, but they do so in different countries. And the very small part, the pink part, is when they go in investment in uh, R&D or in something that is more technology related. And the smaller part other than that are activities that are perhaps uh, more the value added activities. As you can see from this graph that uh, why there is a variety of uh, OFDI is outward foreign direct investment type, the most dominant activities remain in operation and sales reflecting a very basic and unsophisticated nature of Thailand outward FDI. That is not uh, that's not wrong, but we should also see that for smaller and for selected firms that are able to invest in something that is very exclusive or will help improve their knowledge and R&D, that is another way of uh, shortcutting, building up uh, the knowledge the base in the country, rather than just uh, trying to reform uh, education, which will need to be done, but it will take time to do so. And uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, from about the French Revolution that the, the, the government that comes in and the need to reform, I have to reflect on that quote again, but I can't remember it correctly. But rather than focusing only on uh, inviting professionals from overseas or education uh, at home, which need to be done, I stress. We also should be looking at how firms and industry and SME could also tap into the knowledge that is out there in the world. Why can't Thai firms that uh, try to operate in some area, why can't they go and buy companies in the West that perhaps need to expand their uh, production base in Thailand and then use that as a technology to, uh, to support each other. For, I think that Israel is a great example of how agribusiness and agriculture technology is out there. And if CP can see some of the useful technology, why not buy that into the Thai country and then at the same time increase their positioning within the value chain. This is the distribution of uh, outward foreign direct investment. You can see that mainly it's still in the region, but uh, very small and limited number of firms, and mainly the large firms, that are able to uh, go further into more developed economies. So again, uh, to conclude my point, I go back to my three main points and to stress that we should not only be looking at new things and new industry, the new S-curve, because if we only do that, what we will be doing is only to use tax incentive and to use the 99-year leasehold to attract investment to the part where we might not be able to provide all sort of required factors of production because we don't yet have the uh, skilled labor and all that. So we should also be thinking of 4.0 as a way to really use technology to increase the efficiency of how 
the value chain of several industries that are already there, that we have potentials to uh, increase and upgrade those areas. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, point. In the